Well, let's get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Science History Institute's Joseph Priestley Society Lecture Series. I'm Charlie Alcorn, a member of the JPS Committee, and we'll be moderating our talk today. The JPS series promotes a deeper understanding of science, technology, and industry with an emphasis on innovation and entrepreneurship. Speakers are leaders from a wide range of large and small chemical and life science companies and the financial consulting and academic communities. We have presentations on diverse topics this year. You can find more information by going to the sciencehistory.org website and navigating to the events section. Please join us in our discussion today by typing your questions into the Q&A panel, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. We'll be collecting them and they will be addressed at the end of the presentations as time permits. Antimicrobial resistance poses a substantial risk to our society. At a recent Senate subcommittee hearing on superbugs, the witnesses included a mother with cystic fibrosis and bacteria in her lungs, which is resistant to nearly all available antibiotics. A surgeon who described how procedures could not be performed or led to death due to antibiotic resistant infections. A veterinarian discussing the microbial risks to animals and the CEO of a biotech who discussed the challenges of both developing antimicrobials and getting them added to hospital formularies. Innovations are required to rapidly develop and deploy new antibiotics that respond to existing and evolving requirements. The JPS is thrilled to welcome Dr. Michael J. Mahan and Dr. Cesar De La Fuente, who are at the forefront of efforts to address the need for new antibiotics. Dr. Michael Mahan received his PhD in genetics from the University of Utah. He was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School, where he began his work on the molecular mechanisms underlying salmonella pathogenesis. Dr. Mahan joined the University of California Santa Barbara faculty in 1993 and was co-founder and director of Remedine Corporation, a biotech company in Santa Barbara. Dr. Cesar De La Fuente is a presidential assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, where he leads the machine biology group. Previously, he pursued a postdoctoral research. He, he pursued postdoctoral research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and earned a PhD at the University of British Columbia. Dr. De La Fuente pioneered the development of the first computer-designed antibiotic with efficacy in animal models, demonstrating the application of artificial intelligence for antibiotic discovery. He is an NIH MIRA investigator and one of the youngest ever to be inducted into the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering. He has received numerous awards and serves on the editorial boards of more than 20 journals. We'll begin with Dr. Mahan. Michael. Well, I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, there's a storm coming, and it's going to be brutal. Um, and it's uh, antibiotic-resistant superbugs. And uh, the World Health Organization has declared them as one of the top threats to global health. There's 5 million deaths per year associated with antibiotic resistance. And there's drug-resistant strep, drug-resistant staph, drug-resistant TB. Uh, and we're re-entering the pre-antibiotic era where a simple scratch can be fatal. And I'm gonna tell you a story about a person in Santa Barbara, a woman in Santa Barbara got a UTI. Um, she's about in her early 50s, she had a family. Uh, a UTI is one of the most common infections in the, in the uh, United States, eight, 15 million a year, got antibiotics. Uh, she still, still got worse. When they changed the antibiotic, got worse, got hospitalized, organs shut down and she died of sepsis. So, uh, you know, this is, from, this is unacceptable. I mean, this is a common infection. And for someone that young dying of, a, of this type of infection from the community um, is just, just not acceptable. So what is sepsis? Okay, it's the body's overreaction to infection. Um, this injures your tissues and your organs. Um, it does this by, uh, it's called systemic inflammation and blood clotting throughout the body. Um, it's a medical emergency, okay? Um, 20 to 30% mortality. Um, sepsis is the number one cause of death in US hospitals. It's the number one cause of hospital readmissions. 
It's also it's the most expensive uh, disease uh, in, in U.S. hospitals. And, and to the right, I think, is one, one of the most important. Uh, when you, if you survive sepsis, you're not necessarily okay. Up to 50% of the survivors suffer from long-term physical, physical and, and or psychological effects for their life. And your lifespan has been um, severely shortened, actually. Um, time is everything. Time to antibiotics is everything. And for every hour that antibiotics are delayed, you have a 4% increase in death. So it's important to get not only antibiotic, but get the right antibiotic. Okay, and, and this is a summary side of how important antibiotics are to our world. Everybody knows about the bottom here, the bottom, the, the foundation basically is for infections, you know, wound infections, UTI, pneumonia, blood infections, et cetera. Um, but it, it also basically for any invasive procedure in the hospital um, depends on antibiotics. And now these bacteria become resistant to these antibiotics and uh, we don't have any um, ways to treat them, these, these, these surgical procedures are, are, are not going to happen. Okay. They're going to be very, very dangerous. So again, we're re, you know, we we're re-entering the pre-antibiotic era where these antibiotics are not working. Well, where have the antibiotics gone? Okay. So the history is the history of antibiotics. Uh, they were discovered in 1929 with penicillin. The first uh, therapeutic use was in the 1940s, basically World War II. And then there's the golden age of antibiotics, the 1950s and 1960s. So two decades, uh, the vast majority of antibiotic classes used today were discovered then, okay? And the last antibiotic class was discovered in the year 2000. Okay, so it's been 23 years. And there's a famous quote from uh, Andy Grove, who's the founder of Intel, which is, I think is appropriate here. Success breeds complacency, complacency breeds failure. And that's where we're at, we got complacent. Okay, well, why has pharma abandoned antibiotic research? In fact, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies now do uh, less than five percent, less than five percent of all antibiotic research, and it's really, really, it's, it's it's not complicated. It's simple math. It's risky and it's not profitable. Okay, it takes ten to fifteen years at a cost of one point five billion dollars to bring an antibiotic to market. The sales of an, an average antibiotic is less than fifty million a year. And the math doesn't work, okay? And so what they've done, they divert their resources into blockbuster drugs, such as drugs that treat cancer, heart disease, cholesterol, diabetes, arthritis, chronic conditions for which you have these, uh, you're now delivering these very expensive medications for a lifetime. That's what they're, that's what they're focused on and that's how they make their money. Well, how do, you, how do we fight antibiotic resistance? And I can tell you about two, Two things that we've done in my lab at, at uh, UC, uh, UC Santa Barbara, we've developed a new antibiotic test that shows that rejected antibiotics can treat infections. That is our antibiotic to toolbox is much bigger than we once thought. And also we've developed a new antibiotic that can cure untreatable diseases. Here's the first part about the new antibiotic test. Um, we've shown that there are FDA approved antibiotics available at your neighborhood pharmacy have the capability of curing drug resistant infections, but they're not used because the gold standard tests that physicians rely on indicates they will not work. So we're, we're aimed to correct a fundamental flaw in antibiotic testing. Well, what's the flaw? Well, in 1966, the World Health Organization made a decree, a global decree. The world will, will check, do, will assess antibiotics susceptibility this way. We'll grow them on one medium, Mueller Hinton broth, which is basically a very rich medium chicken broth. And it was, it was, it made a lot of sense. Um, it, was, it was designed to grow bacteria. It was cheap, it was widely available and many pathogens grow on it. So three great reasons. Okay, but the, the, the problem is, is that, uh, you know, they were designed to grow bacteria and bacteria, they, they, they change when they're in the body. They, they, they're able to sense and respond to their environment. So this new test we're gonna tell you about is built on not this rich media, but cell culture medium. And cell culture medium is designed to, to grow human cells. It's designed to mimic the body. And if you mimic the body, you can, you, you can now impact drug potency. So in a little more detail, this is, this is the, the global test that people have been using since 1966. 
uh, where there hasn't been a change worldwide in nearly 60 years. Okay, on the left here, bacteria are grown on this Mueller Hentgen broth or MHB. And then they're exposed to uh, uh, several antibiotics, a panel of antibiotics. And here we have antibiotic C kills them on the Petri plate. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what the gold standard test says to use. That's what's advised to the physician. And that's what the physician prescribes. Okay, so now on the right side, the problem is what works in a Petri dish does not always work in the body and vice versa. So you can, you can have one antibiotic C can work well on a Petri plate, but not work well in the body. And the proposed solution is now test antibiotics and solutions that create, that are more closely relate, uh, uh, resemble human tissue. And the cell culture medium is one of these media. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about a new, the new antibiotic test that we developed. It's uh, uh, based on what's called physiologic media. It mimics the body, the physiology of the body. It identified rejected antibiotics by the standard tests that actually cure infections. Vice versa, it also uh, identified approved antibiotics that are destined to fail. And we're going to leave you some applications to the uh, prescription and use of anti current antibiotics and also um, how we can now uh, enhance and improve uh, antibiotic discovery. Well, can physiologic testing reveal effective antibiotics? This is the standard test that's done worldwide. Basically, what physicians care about are two things. They care, is, it, is, the, is the bacterium sensitive or resistant to these antibiotics, S or R? Okay, on the top is with miller hintonblatt the standard test. You can see that the dark, the, the, when, the, when the, the circles are closed in, the bacteria are growing, they're growing, they're growing, they're growing. And then we have a point where the antibiotic will kill. It's called a minimum inhibitory concentration or MIC. And that's, in this case, it's resistant. It takes too much drug to kill that bacteria. But we're wondering, what we questioned was, if we could grow these bacteria in cell culture media, which mimic the body, could we now identify drugs that were rejected by this test that it actually would work? And so they said, that instead of being this 128 micrograms per mil, you could now kill them at eight micrograms per mil, and that would be considered sensitive. So we, uh, so now we're questioning, can rejected antibiotics cure drug-resistant infections? So here's a case from a patient, a MRSA, a methicillin-resistant Staph aureus patient that died of the infection. Uh, and we took three commonly used clinical antibiotics that are used for other indications, but not for this indication because the mueller hinton broth, the standard, the gold standard test here, says it's resistant. These are penicillin analogs. And in our cell culture medium test, we said they were, they came out sensitive. And then the mouse, when we infect the mice with the MRSA strain that killed the patient, we can cure the infection. Vice versa, we've identified approved antibiotics that are destined for treatment failure. Here we have colostin is, a, is an old antibiotic, actually. It's, a, uh, it's a called a last resort drug. It's very toxic, actually. It's used only in, you know, uh, when there's nothing else to use. And uh, here's three nasty pathogens, acinetobacter, Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas, multidrug resistant pathogens. And the standard test says, yes, use them. Mueller Hinton Bross says they're sensitive when you do the tests on, on the Petri plates. In the cell culture media tests, they, it comes up resistant. And we now infect a mouse with these separately, with these three strains. Uh, the answer is the drug doesn't work. Okay, so these drugs, even though they, they are approved by the test, are destined to fail. And they did fail, at least in mice. So we've done. Uh, uh, close to 1,500 different pathogen antibiotic combinations with our tests and, and physiologic media versus the standard gold standard test. And what we find is that uh, that the standard test is accurate. They, they, they basically they, they, they agree with each other about half the time. Uh, there's a large uh, window that's uncertain. We don't have to go on that today. But the point is that 15% of the time, they don't agree. They cross, what, they cross what's called a clinical threat threshold Sensitive is resistant and resistant is sensitive. And so the, the bottom line from this is that the wrong antibiotic may be prescribed today, 15% of the time. And that, that's just not acceptable. That, you know, when you start bumping up and look at the math, a million people, 150,000 people are not getting the right antibiotic, possibly, potentially. Okay. Now, uh, it's in the literature, it's known that rejected antibiotics cure human infections. There's many samples, examples of this. Uh, MRSA, 
and again, the gold standard test says, do not use these rejected antibiotics. They've been rejected. Do not use them for this indication. And the answer is it's cured several types of uh, human infections. And so physicians have known this problem has exists for a very long time. Okay, so what's the advantages of this new antibiotic test? Um, it has improved accuracy. It's simple, it's scalable, it's affordable. Um, it's an easy transition to, to a new test. So the conclusion is that from this, the first part of the talk is we've identified rejected antibiotics that cured drug-resistant infections. We've identified approved antibiotics that are destined for failure. And we showed you some applications to the prescription and use of current antibiotics. That's will now reduce sepsis, potentially reduce sepsis, and also the increase the antibiotic uh, uh, discovery of new ones. And because it's gonna decrease the time and cost, because you have the right antibiotic early, these antibiotic, these uh, trials are expensive and they're expensive on the back end, the animal testing, the human testing. But if you start with the right drug first, it's really gonna, um, uh, it's gonna make it a lot cheaper to do and faster to do these experiments. So that's the end of the first part of the, 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 the talk. The second part is I'm gonna tell you about a new antibiotic that we've developed that kills every pathogen tested without resistance. Um, how it was discovered was uh, serendipitous. Uh, the US Army had a pressing need to charge cell phones. And what they tell us is when your cell phone die, you die. And so uh, they had this uh, a call for this and a chemist colleague of mine received funding from the US Army and he had this crazy idea where maybe bacteria could, could, uh, could power a cell phone. And the idea is that bacteria are power cells. They make, they make power. And what they use that power is to make more bacteria. But, and what they do, they funnel electrons in from the bacterial membrane, which is the outside of the cell. That's where the power is generated. And it generate, and it's squirts electrons into the cell. And what if we could now flip that switch and have the electrons now being directed out of the cell, we could power possibly power a cell phone. And or other uh, electronic devices, and, and it's working actually. We can power a light doing that. So basically, it was like a, a, Gator, a Gatorade backpack. You could fill your backpack full of Gatorade, throw some bacteria in, and now power your cell phone in the desert, the, the jungle, the cave, whatever, and uh, and uh, and you can stay in communication for an indefinite amount of time. Well, can these compounds work as antibiotics? And um, and the idea was that they disrupt the membrane. The membrane's the power, the power plant of the bacterium. And we asked, well, could, could it cure, cure superbugs? And for me, that, that wasn't the issue. I thought they would, it would kill, but I thought that they'd be like drink and bleach, that you're now disrupting the surface of the, the power plant of the bacteria. Uh, you also might be doing the power plant of our cells too. And uh, uh, they were super toxic, most of them, but what, they, were all, they were all toxic. But not the, except with the exception of one. I'm going to tell you about the one that uh, we found. Um, what are these compounds? They have a long name. Doesn't matter. It's called. They're called conjugated oligoelectrolytes. They're not antibiotics. They are. They were made to charge a phone. Okay. So they don't look like antibiotics. Um, they are. They're like little chemical Legos, basically, to capture electrons. And they're just. Here we have a picture. Uh, mod, they're modular structures, and and you can make basically an infinite amount of uh, different variations. And that's the way that they look like chemical Legos, basically. Um, so I'm gonna tell you about this one that was not toxic, um, killed all pathogen tested, it cured untreatable diseases, and there was no detectable resistance. And so basically it gets, the point is that it gets inside the membrane and now this, and that, that's, that's not good for the bacterium, okay? So here's, uh, here's the data for that killed every pathogen tested. Here's some nasty pathogens. Um, CDC has the three sep uh, threat levels, urgent, serious, concerning. This panel here can, contains all three of those. Um, and to say what urgent is, threat level urgent, this bacteria is an immediate public health threat that requires urgent and aggressive action. Um, here's several of these nasty pathogens, Acinetobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, MRSA, gonorrhea, Pseudomonas, this is on, a, on, on this uh, antibiotic susceptibility test. These are sensitive to, uh, to every one of these pathogens. Most notably, here's our the ones in yellow. These are the, these this, these are derived from patients that died of the infection where they where clear antibiotics didn't work, including this. This is the UTI, the one that killed a, the woman in Santa Barbara. She had a what's called a carbapenem resistant Klebsiella. This is one of the na most nasty pathogens known. It's an urgent. It's it's the it's threat level urgent. 
And this Klebsiella was resistant to 20 out of 22 antibiotics done, uh, uh, performed at the hospitals. And the two that they that they weren't, they were they uh, they didn't work. Okay, so that's fine. But can you cure can can you cure infections? And so we took both the again these both of these strains, the MRSA and the Klebsiella. We now uh, uh, infected animals, and we asked, can we now can will the animals survive? And here we have untreated, they all die, and treated. Uh, either they all live or they're nearly all live. And now it poses the question, um, could, could these COEs have cured these patients? And lastly, I'm gonna say that this, this is something we're very proud of actually, is that it does not promote bacterial resistance. I'm a geneticist, that's my training. We make mutants, that's what we do for a living. And uh, anyway, we you wanna make a mutant because, and, and actually resistance is one of the biggest uh, primary concerns of de antibiotic development. You, get, you can have the most effective antibiotic in the world, but if bacteria become resistant to it quickly, it's not worth anything, okay? And so the first thing that a geneticist does, you 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 see how 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 easy to get resistance, and then now you get, basically you're breaking it down so you can now figure out how the drug works, okay? So there's a common test called serial dilution. Basically, you just take the bacteria and you, you, you give them antibiotic, you grow them, you grow them all day, all night, and you switch the media, switch the drug every day. We did this for three weeks and we found no resistance. That's really unusual. Where current antibiotics would be a hundred, some to a thousand fold if you now, like ciprofloxacin, and common uh, currently used antibiotics would have very high levels of resistance after that kind of treatment. <clears throat> well, why are there no resistance? Well, well, this, this doesn't have one target, this drug, intercalates into the bacterial membrane, the power plant, and it disrupts many functions. And so to become resistant, you'd have to now be resistant to all of these functions. We believe that's why uh, uh, this thing has, has evaded resistance. In fact, we have a colleague down in uh, La Jolla, and at the time, um, they had this special piece of equipment that measured antibiotic resistance. There was only four in the world. And we went. I went down there, drove down there, and said, hey, we have this new antibiotic. It doesn't have resistance and he kind of looked at me just you know no way and i said i, I left him i left him the antibiotic and a couple of really nasty pathogens and said hey try it in your in your machine and so about six weeks later i get a you know call email you know text urgent three exclamation points you know i thought someone died you know call me you know whatever and uh, anyway they it, it uh, he had said that the, this is among the one of the most irresistible antibiotics we have ever tested and what their lab does for a major pharmaceutical company they, they test the irresistibility uh, of the drug 24-7-365. And this is, uh, this is the most irresistible drug they have seen in 20 years. Okay, and so what, what's the advantages of these uh, of, uh, of these uh, COEs? Well, they're really, they're simple molecules. Uh, they're easy to make, they're, easy, they're, easy, they're, they're very cheap to make, and they're easily modified. And you have to be a chemist here. Look at the bottom, that, those are three commonly used Antibi uh, antibiotics, Abacaz, it's a penicillin type thing, vancomycin, uh, and, and, and the ZPAC. Basically, bacteria are much better chemists than we are. These are not, they don't look like antibiotics, antibiotics. they don't behave like antibiotics. And last thing, leading to some conclusions, is that, uh, is that space of these COEs cured and treatable diseases. There's no detectable resistance. They're simple, scalable, and affordable, and they're easily modified. Well, what's next? Uh, you know, we need to test, do drug testing. Okay, um, there's a new antibiotic test that, that we have and, and they'll allow us to do what's called adjunctive therapy. We can now add to a therapy that's not working. And when that, when that had now, uh, if that works well, we will now do, let us do replacement therapy, which means actually that'll be, this test will be the test that physicians will use. And last is the, uh, the new antibiotic. Uh, we have to do drug safety and, and mechanism of action studies. And lastly, um, yeah, there is a storm coming, but there is hope. And just imagine the possibilities. We have a new test that shows that our antibiotic, we have a lot better antibiotics than we thought we had. We also have a new way to make antibi uh, antibiotics. We don't, we don't know about the safety. And last is, this is where I work. You see Santa Barbara, it's right on the ocean. It's beautiful here. Um, and so a lot of the work was done by Doug Hightoff, Lucian Barnes, Josh and my son, Scott Mahan. And the brains behind this were two other professors, uh, Gibbs, or three other professors, Guy Bazan, Chuck Samuel, David Lowe. We've also the, the antibiotic resistance guy down in the, at uh, La Jolla's Andre, uh, Andre Osterman. 
We also work closely with our, uh, our local hospital, Jeff, two infectious disease specialists, Jeffrey Freed and Lynn Fitzgibbons, and also a, a very close friend and colleague from the University of Sydney does all the stat work. Anyway, thanks for the, for the time, and uh, we'll, I guess, uh, answer questions at the end. And I think you're on mute, Charles. Thank you, Dr. Mahan, for that engaging and very informative presentation. As you said, we'll hold questions until the end, so please type your questions into the Q&A panel. Um, I'd now, now like to welcome Dr. De La Fuente. Uh, perfect. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, you're good. Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, well, yep. Yeah, thank you, uh, Charles, for the for the introduction and for uh, for the invitation. It's a it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today, I thought I would tell you a little bit about um, something that we've been working on for for a number of years, but a concept that has emerged in our research probably in the last couple of years, which is the concept of molecular de extinction and our ability to resurrect molecules from past times to uh, to address problems that we have today, such as the problem of antibiotic resistance. And I'll tell you about how we got here uh, to the concept of molecular de-extinction through a journey of uh, doing a lot of the early work on uh, using computers and using AI for uh, in, in the context of biology and antibiotics and, and microbiology. And uh, we're very much motivated, uh, like Michael, uh, by antibiotic resistance. Like he mentioned, this is a huge global health problem. It affects every corner of the world. It's projected to kill 10 million people by 2050, uh, which actually corresponds to staggering number of uh, about one death every three seconds. And so we're really hugely motivated by um, trying to do something about this, uh, right, to prevent this from happening. And uh, one thing that we've been working on for for a long time now, um, uh, you know, certainly over five years, but I've been thinking about the use of computers in in antibiotics for for around a decade, um, is that uh, you know can we use computers to accelerate antibiotic discovery? Can we can we um, uh, translate the chemical complexity of molecules into a, a, a language that is understandable by the computers so then machines can help us uh, design better and uh, better and new antibiotics and so I'll, I'll weave uh, um, along a couple of stories um, uh, in, a, in a chronological fashion of how we how we got to molecular de extinction by doing, like I said, a lot of the early uh, computational work in this area. And one of the initial questions, this is uh, again many years, you know, about eight years ago or so, and we asked ourselves was, you know, how can we teach computers how to innovate at the molecular level to then try to create uh, useful antibiotics. And after giving this a lot of thought, uh, we decided that the best way to do this was to actually mimic the greatest engine that we have for generating uh, um, diversity and innovation and um, at any level, and that's evolution itself. And so we decided to teach computers how to execute Darwin's algorithm of evolution so that they could evolve molecules to make them, uh, turn them into better antibiotics. And uh, that's what we did in this initial paper that we ended up publishing in 2018 uh, um, and uh, in Nature Communications, where we encoded an initial population of, of uh, small proteins from nature onto the computer. And then uh, we taught the computer to evolve them. And the primary steps of evolution are mutation, selection, recombination, and then n-fold iterations of that uh, process in a feedback loop, you get essentially evolution. So the computer was able to evolve the molecules to make them uh, better antibiotics. This is all driven by a fitness function uh, that predicts that you know the higher the number, the, the better antibiotic that molecule will be. And so at least on the computer, we're making them uh, uh, these molecules uh, turn into into uh, optimized antibiotics, and um, and uh, generating actually yielding uh, uh, molecules that are different from what nature has produced with amino acid ratios in this case, which are the building blocks that are different from what we typically encounter in nature. So here are some of the uh, small proteins called peptides that the computer generated. And here we reach a roadblock, right? That uh, everything that we see on the screen is predicted to be a great antibiotic, but we 
we don't, uh, you know, we can't rely on the computer's assumptions. We're really early on in this field and we still need to validate everything experimentally. So what we did is we made all of these using chemistry and we screened them against bacteria that are problematic and, and um, clinically relevant in the in the laboratory. And we were able to identify a lead compound uh, that was this uh, this one here. You can see this beautiful alpha-helical structure and we called it Wavanin 2. And uh, this was actually a highly potent antibiotic capable of killing bacteria at low doses. So then once we confirmed this, that the computer-generated uh, molecule was capable of killing bacteria in vitro, uh, we wanted to see how it actually killed the bacteria and what the mechanism of action was. And um, this was actually quite uh, remarkable in the sense that um, whereas previously described this type of antibiotic, which are peptide antibiotics, tend to kill bacteria by depolarizing the membrane. This machine-made uh, peptide actually operated in the, in the opposite way by hyperpolarizing the membrane. And so uh, this was really not written in uh, or incorporated into the fitness function that we uh, that drove the algorithm. And so we characterize this as an AI innovation. Um, and this happens sometimes when computers able, are able to actually uh, come up with emergent properties that were not initially uh, written into the algorithm. Um, and so uh, that was a pretty curious and remarkable uh, initial result. And then because we're interested in eventually translating everything that we do in the lab, we wanted to see if the uh, Wabanin 2, this sort of synthetic antibiotic, was capable of reducing infections in a preclinical mouse model. And um, uh, here we can see that it did. Um, it reduced infection better. Here's the untreated control group of mice. So it was able to reduce the infection by several orders of magnitude. And this really opened up our eyes and the eyes of many people and opened up new avenues for thinking about how to use computers and, and AI uh, for antibiotic discovery. So along the, the same time, um, I started thinking about how we could use machines and algorithms to actually mine biology to try to accelerate the discovery of, of antibiotics, not only design them, like I've, I've shown here with evolutionary programming, but also able to mine uh, large amounts of data to try to find um, antibiotics that might be encoded in those data. And here we took inspiration from image and speech recognition algorithms, but instead of recognizing facial expressions or sounds, we wanted to recognize molecular patterns that were that constituted potential antibiotics. And um, initially uh, with collaborators, we developed algorithms that allowed us to mine individual proteins to see if we could find fragments within the protein that corresponded to potential antibiotic sequences. So to illustrate this in a visual way, uh, we can have a protein in three dimensions. We can then display it in two dimensions with the amino acid code in the y-axis. And these algorithms are, you know, sort of pattern recognition algorithms. So they run through the code and they identify regions within the code that are predicted to have antimicrobial properties. And so these are all uh, color coded by different colors. Um, and again, this is only a prediction because it's computationally driven, but it's a, a rather powerful one because it allows us to, you know, uh, mine individual proteins and then identify within the protein uh, regions such as, for example, this fragment in yellow that correspond to a predicted antibiotic. And then we can, uh, using synthetic biology methods, we can extract that fragment um, to then try to develop it into something useful in the lab. So we we're doing this for a while, mining individual proteins, but then with advances in compute power and advances in algorithmic um, uh, power, and we realized that we could scale from individual proteins to entire proteomes. And this is when we decided to embark on this journey of actually uh, mining for the first time the human proteome as a source of antibiotics. And uh, this is actually an incredibly fast process. So in about one hour, this is uh, at the time when we did this, it was using 48 CPUs. In about one hour, we could mine the entire human proteome. And uh, when I talk about the human proteome, we actually did, we went beyond the 20,000 proteins, we actually did 42,000 because we uh, counted isoforms, which is around 100 million peptides in one hour, right? With our current compute power. And so this is quite remarkable, the kinds of things that we can do now with, with, uh, with uh, computational tools. And uh, this actually allowed us to discover a whole new world of antibiotics that were previously undescribed in our very own proteome. Uh, we call these encrypted peptides. We found thousands of them encrypted in our body. 
And uh, then we synthesized a number of them using chemistry to try to learn from them. Uh, we learned that they displayed broad spectrum activity. So they killed both gram-negative and gram-positive bacterial pathogens. And so we hypothesized that they might play a role in host immunity. And a lot of them uh, were actually cleaved off by proteases uh, from the parent protein, which had an unrelated function. And I'll happy to, to, be, to get into those details during the Q&A. So then we we tested the anti-infective efficacy of these uh, encrypted peptides in uh, in preclinical mouse models, and I'll just show you one of the one of the models where we tested this is a skin infection abscess infection model, and uh, we can see uh, uh, the mice were infected with two different pathogens, so the monosarginose and ebalmani, and uh, in gray you have the untreated control group of mice, so you have it gives you a sense of the the amount of bacteria that are in those infected mice. And then uh, we have monotherapy with one peptide, monotherapy with another peptide. And particularly when we combine them in cocktails in purple, we see really a dramatic uh, decrease in the infection in both um, infections uh, that we did here. And so, uh, you know, we found thousands of these sequences previously and un recognized to play a role in immunity in the human proteome. And so then we started thinking, right, uh, what does this mean? Are these sequences or similar sequences found maybe throughout evolution and maybe across the tree of life? So we started thinking about molecules, of molecules as documents of evolutionary history. And these are some of the questions that we ask ourselves and my team here in, in many, many brainstorming sessions. You know, are these sequences conserved or do they mutate over time? Are they produced throughout evolution? And if so, were they also produced by extinct organisms, not only extant organisms? And can we infer biology and look in and investigate in these this, this, uh, molecules instead of just looking at DNA, for example? And then also, also, can we use them as templates for antibiotic development? And a lot of these uh, conversations took us to thinking about molecules, again, as documents of evolutionary history and uh, molecules that were produced perhaps in past times. And so we started thinking about Jurassic Park in one of the brainstorming sessions. And if you remember... The concept of the extinction uh, in this case, in the movie, was to bring back a dinosaur, right? Or dinosaurs uh, back to life. Uh, but of course, this had uh, numerous issues, including ethical issues and ecological issues and, uh, frankly, technical limitations that I think make it impossible to actually bring a T-Rex back to life because we don't have sufficient genomic coverage. But uh, instead of thinking about entire uh, bringing back to life entire organisms, why not bring back molecules? And we started to really think about this seriously, and we came up with the term molecular de-extinction. Bringing back molecules from past times to try to address uh, present-day problems such as the problem of antibiotic resistance. And since we had done the mining of the human proteome, of the modern human proteome, Homo sapiens, we decided to actually look at our closest relatives. And these are uh, Neanderthals and Denisovans. So we, we decided to explore their proteomes to see if we could find similar sequences that we had found in the human proteome that have antimicrobial properties. And in order to tackle this, we developed a machine learning pipeline um, that we called Pankleaf. That essentially what it does is it takes the proteomic data from Neanderthals and Denisovans and modern humans, and it chews it up in little fragments. And then we apply machine learning and human expert filters to predict whether those fragments uh, will be uh, antimicrobial or not. And uh, I'll give you just, uh, you know, here are some examples of some of the, the, the encrypted sequences that we found encoded in larger proteins, both for archaic and for modern humans. And um, this is just one example here, right? For example, in Neanderthal ATP synthase subunit A, this is the protein. And in blue, in the darker blue, we can see the encrypted sequence that we found. And uh, this uh, sort of rather complicated name, we've actually renamed this as Neanderthalin 1. It comes from Neanderthals. And as I'll, I'll, I'll show later, the, this actually had an infective efficacy in a preclinical mouse model. Then we... Um, um, we um, we decided to look at the mechanism of action. And I'll just tell you some of the early evidence that we have um, that uh, modern sequences tended to target bacteria through the outer membrane, uh, whereas the ancient ones tended to target the cytoplasmic membrane. So we, you know, even though this is a small sample size, we're starting to see differences between more sort of modern sequences as opposed to more, uh, more archaic uh, molecular sequences. And I think uh, we'll be able to, to learn more about the biology in the future. 
We then tested the anti-infective efficacy and the safety of this, uh, both ancient and modern sequences in two different preclinical mouse models. And again, Neanderthal in one, like I mentioned, was probably the lead compound out of all these experiments. Okay, so we we did we found this uh, sort of antibiotics in extinct humans in 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 ancient uh, hominids, and then we decided to to expand this even further to explore the whole extinctome. These are all the extinct organisms that are ex that, that that we have data for, and uh, in order to tackle this because it was a lot more proteomes, we we actually decided to develop a a, a, a much more sort of complicated uh, deep learning model in this case. <laughs> And um, we called it APEX, the deep learning model, and it was capable of systematically sampling, you know, every essentially every extinct uh, proteome that we have available. And um, this includes proteomes throughout evolutionary history, including the Holocene and the Pleistocene. And here I'm showing some of the organisms um, where we found uh, some of the most potent antibiotics that we found were from some of these. And this includes the, the woolly mammoth, includes the giant sloth, includes uh, ancient elephants, ancient zebras, um, and so on. And uh, you know, I won't go into all the different all the details because of the uh, the, the lack of time, but. Um, we we synthesize a lot of these. We elucidated their mechanism of action. You know how they target bacteria, and uh, and we studied their anti-infective efficacy in preclinical mouse models. And um, some of the the top candidates that we were able to find come from the woolly mammoth, the ancient sea cow, the giant sloth, and the extinct giant elk. And so we really we've opened up uh, a, a whole new way of looking at antibiotic discovery by doing this sort of proteome mining of extinct organisms. Um, you might be asking yourself, you know, why molecular de extinction? Uh, we've, it's already enabled us to explore new sequence space. We think that can unlock new biology in the future. It's a, really expanded our vision of life and its molecular diversity, right? Because we're finding things that were previously undisclosed to have uh, antimicrobial properties that might play a role in, in host immunity throughout evolution. And uh, finally, just the basic premise that uh, bringing back molecules from the past can open our eyes and give us um, you know, alternative solutions uh, to address some of the problems that we face today, including the huge problem of antibiotic uh, resistance. I'll just mention a couple of things that are ramifications from this work. Uh, first of all, on the bioethics side, um, I remember the feeling when we first uh, got these uh, molecules on the computer uh, and uh, we saw that they were not uh, expressed in any, any living organism. And so the moment uh, where we had to resurrect these molecules using chemistry was really thrilling from a scientific perspective, but it also brought up uh, bioethical uh, concerns. And so uh, we've started engaging with bioethicists to, to try to do this um, as safely as possible, uh, as we believe in a responsible innovation. And finally, on the patenting side, this was quite funny. When I went to the patent uh, office at, here at the university, I, you know, I told them, you know, I know that natural sequences are not patentable, but what about sequences that used to exist at one point, but are not no longer present in the biological world? And so nobody's really sure. And this is actually open up, opening up uh, new areas of patent law uh, that are uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. And so we'll see what happens um, uh, along those lines. But um, in terms of uh, next steps, uh, we plan to mine, uh, computationally mine every proteome in the world. This is a lot of them. So we're dividing this. Uh, this huge project um, across the tree of life. And since we had done the work with the eukaryotes, looking at uh, homo sapiens and, and archaic hominids, uh, we next decided to look at bacteria uh, through a, a couple of, of wonderful collaborations. And I'll just briefly summarize this. Uh, so one with uh, uh, the Coagia lab, um, uh, we looked at the global microbiome. These are almost 90,000 microbial genomes and over 60,000 metagenomes. Looking at the global microbiome, these are bacteria and microbes coming from uh, many, many different habitats across the world. And we're able to find almost 1 million new sequences with antimicrobial properties encoded in all this uh, huge microbial diversity. And uh, finally, uh, through another fantastic collaboration with the Bad Lab at Stanford, uh, we uh, looked at almost 2,000 human gut metagenomes. And again, we were able to find hundreds of new uh, antimicrobial uh, sequences. And so if you ask me about um, what we've been able to do in the last half a decade or so, I would say the one uh, really remarkable thing has been that, uh, you know, using traditional uh, methods uh, to... Um, it takes about three to six years to discover one preclinical candidate. Um, and now using computers, it takes hours to discover 
thousands or hundreds of thousands of candidates. So I think this is this has been really um, a remarkable progress that we've been able to make. That if you had asked me six years ago, I would have said that's probably impossible. But uh, but AI and computers have really enabled this. And then finally, on the peptide side, we've been able to really expand the known sequence space of peptides with antibiotic activity from about 6,000 that were previously known um, in humanity uh, to now uh, well over 1 million. So I think that has also been uh, quite a remarkable uh, uh, progress. And uh, this is a very young field at the intersection of AI and antibiotic discovery. This is looking at... Uh, publications, and we can see that there were barely any publications until 2018. So it's, it's only half a decade old, basically, the field. And so for anybody in the audience, um, we're, uh, we're always uh, seeking to recruit uh, young minds to, to try to tackle this big, this big problem. And so just to summarize some of the things that I mentioned, um, the sort of the Wabanin 2 design, which was able to reduce infections in, in preclinical mouse models. Then we created a data set in-house that has actually enabled a lot of the applications that I've mentioned today, um, our human proteome exploration, and then our molecular de-extinction work uh, and our expansion into other um, uh, organisms across the tree of life as well. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, our lab members, past and present, um, who did a lot of the work that I presented, our fantastic collaborators, funders, and then I'll leave you here with links to our website, email address and Twitter or, or X. Um, and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Dilafuente. That was uh, incredibly enlightening and fascinating. We have a few questions from the attendees and I'll, I'll try and go through them in uh, some sort of structured fashion. One second. Um, I guess there was a question, I, I think this is directed to you, Dr. Mahan. Is the mouse test generally accepted? Well, that's just the, yeah. So basically, the way the antibiotic discovery works is that uh, it's really highly dependent on the MIC that we talk about that test in the laboratory. That's like the dominant uh, uh, test, and then from there you go to mice or rats, and then you find your way to humans, and then uh, uh, so it's the standard, it's just, you know, the standard highway to getting a drug approved. Okay, looking at your discussion about the using the new um, cell cultures to assess uh, antibiotics or revisit antibiotics, I guess it was. How many antibiotics are there that need to be revisited in the context of this cell culture model? And how long would it take to go through all those? We <clears throat> went through you know, 1,500 combinations. Um, um, the bottom line is that we're saying that, uh, so, What's fascinating is that these a lot of these antibiotics are used for other for other indications for other diseases and uh, but not for these multi drug resistant pathogens and so basically it's a very simple thing to do it's not very hard to do you can do a lot actually so uh, what we're uh, what we found actually uh, that uh, if the two tests the old test and the new test agree it's almost 100% accurate that that's the correct antibiotic uh, when you now do the animal testing. And when they don't agree, um, the new test was uh, was much more um, predictive of accuracy. Either it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. And we had, a, we had a, it couldn't be just a little bit better. It had to be a lot better. We'd first, our first paper on this was in 2015 and really it didn't get traction. You know, we had another one in 2017 and this time we did a very large experiment, one of the largest animal experiments done uh, and uh, and, it, and the stats had to be not close. It had to be much better because we're talking about something that a test that's been done since 1966 to change that. If you know, if people think that that medical discoveries, it is a glacial divide between discovering a lab and a change in a clinic. And something that's been done for nearly 60 years, it has to be a lot better. And so, um, at least the so the short answer to your question is that is that we think that 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 this should be should be done. Um, as a standard, as, a, as their standard test, it's very cheap. There's no new, you don't have to add anything. It's the, all, all you're changing is the media. You know, the equipment's all the same. The, you know, the, it's not expensive. Uh, when you're talking about trying to stop sepsis, the most expensive disease of all diseases, I mean, it's nothing. It's just a fraction. So long answer to your short question. And if you find a previously rejected antibiotic that meets a cell culture test, how long before that can then come to market, let's say? 
Yeah, well, it's it's, it's going to be uh, it's going to be you know the road's hard. I mean, uh, in fact, uh, we had a we came with this discovery. We got we uh, uh, got hooked up with this. There's a place at UCLA that's one of the biggest um, facilities for antibiotic testing in the country. And I had a conversation with them, and for an hour they said, "You guys, Mike, do you know how hard this is going to be to change the way the world does this?" And I just kept saying, "We we we, we both know that this is that the test can be better." And for an hour, that's all I kept saying was that, "Hey, you know, I understand the hurdles, but uh, uh, you know, here we're, we we believe that some uh, a reasonable fraction of antibiotic prescriptions are not right." Okay, and the last thing I want when my friends and family are in the hospital is to worry about if the right antibiotic is being used. They got a lot of other problems, and we can do better, and we can always do better. And uh, so, a timing thing. I mean, we're 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 pushing this. Um, uh, and, uh, and that, that's going to, it's going to happen. Okay. Because the physicians know they've known for a long time, especially the, the physicians have been around for a while that they, they treat patients as a, as an MD, you can prescribe what basically what you want, but you can't go rogue. We call it going off menu. This is going off menu. You have to justify there at every major hospital in the country. There's a, a antibiotic stewardship committee. That's you know reviews what you know what are you, what antibiotics are you using are you you know and, and you and you when you go off the map the roadmap which is this is doing these these physicians that save these patients they went off the roadmap but what they go they said you know what for instance uh, uh, I don't get into specific but for the uh, what they'll say is you know what I've used this drug for a long time for this indication that's worked I don't care about this test it's worked for my patients and they have the data and they use it but it's but it's it's really it's a it's 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 a hard thing for them because they have to do it every time, you know. And now they have a an ex, a reason, a scientific reason they come back and say, you know, it, it's uh, the test we're using isn't accurate for many of these indications. Okay, um, I think for a question for Cesar, I believe the question is: peptides are not generally viewed as therapeutics. Do you have plans to use the three D structure design small molecule non peptidic drugs? Yeah, great question. I mean, yeah, peptides, I would say, and proteins are the, the next frontier, right? Uh, we can now uh, program DNA and uh, mRNA into into different uh, useful things. Uh, uh, you know, peptides, if you think about them, they haven't been the most successful. There are probably around 70 different peptide drugs in the out there, including uh, including insulin, uh, but they're not as maybe as successful as small molecules. So I think... Um, you know the the question uh, we, we are we are looking at uh, developing for example synergy models where we uh we predict synergistic interactions between small molecules and peptides uh thinking more uh, along the lines of adjuvant therapies and um uh, but uh, a lot of the efforts that we do is around uh, proteins and peptides and um other things that we're thinking about is uh, using uh, chemical tweaks uh, to actually create sort of cyclic uh, peptides and constrained structures that are a lot more stable than your typical peptide and a lot more uh, with uh, that possess sort of PKPD profiles that are a lot more desirable than than your typical peptide and so these are some of the things that we're thinking about just to to sort of uh, address some of those uh, some of those potential issues. Okay, and this uh, this is a very broad question, I think, but I'll ask it. Can CRISPR be used to reorient diseases? I think I mean CRISPR has been used as an antimicrobial, right? Uh, it can be used to uh, to uh, interfere with with certain genes in bacterial pathogens that are associated with uh, with viability um and so people have have proposed uh, crispr constructs as uh, potential alternatives to target uh, bacterial pathogens sort of as an antimicrobial um, i don't think those have been too successful when trying to translate them into the into the clinic or anything like that but i think um, just conceptually it provides uh, an additional uh, uh, tool within the toolkit that we have to to try to think about uh, alternative strategies to to counter uh, bacterial pathogens Okay, and I, with regard to mining, I guess when you do the mining, are you looking for essentially known structures, or are you doing something that involves developing and identifying previously unknown structures that have uh, functional uh, or function in, in antimicrobial um, or re resisting any, uh, toxins, whatever? Yeah, that's a great question. So depending on the project that I described, we did different, we took different strategies. 
in the first one, we did the human proteome exploration. Uh, we just uh, use a scoring function. So very simple. We're looking for uh, sequences that had a specific hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic um, to cationic ratio uh, of which we know that if you have a certain um, hydrophobicity to uh, positive and positive charges on a, on a peptide sequence, that will interact with the membrane and disrupt it. Uh, so that was a sort of the basic assumption that we took. Uh, if you think about the, for example, the deep learning model that I showed, that was uh, trained using our in-house data set, which contains thousands of uh, peptide sequences with the respective sort of, um, uh, amino acid sequence. And then there, uh, there are MIC scores, so the antimicrobial scores. And the, the model just learns from uh, what are the sequence requirements for that, and then is able to, to find similar sequences in, in proteomes in a systematic manner. And so we've, we haven't really used structure so much. We haven't used AlphaFold. Um, it doesn't really work that well for peptides um, or small proteins yet. And that makes sense because it hasn't really been trained on, on um, smaller sequences. And so it hasn't uh, proven to be very useful for us yet. Um, we do, uh, the structural work that we do is just experimental to look at, we do, uh, we do see the secondary structure using techniques like cir circular decreasome or NMR, but um, but we don't, we haven't used that, uh, we haven't incorporated that into our algorithms yet. Okay, I got a, a question for Dr. Mahan. Um, the, the new, drug that or new antibiotic you've developed that you're suggesting has very broad applic applicability. Um, how do you bring that type of um, antibiotic to market? How do you how do you assess it in all the different conditions and get it through the approval process? Is that an enormously time consuming process or something that happens? That's it's gonna be hard. I mean uh, they don't they don't look like antibiotics, they don't behave like antibiotics. Um, uh, and we don't know what they do in the environment. We, you know, there's, and we don't know what they, the, the, what I'm most concerned about actually is the toxicity. We've shown in mice that, uh, uh, that if you do, they're, they're called attitude tests, blinded tests, where you give them drugs that are toxic, antibiotics that we know are toxic, like Holston, for instance. And we can, you can see the toxicity. We can, in a blinded test, we, that, that these showed no, no effects whatsoever dur uh, during for uh, treating these mice for a week. But what happens after two weeks? What happens after three weeks? What happens in humans? All that stuff we don't know. So uh, it's going to take a lot of lot of work, a lot of funding um, to be able to do that. Um, but that that goal that's going to be a hard one because uh, uh, because these many, most of these molecules that we tested were very toxic actually. And now we've learned that now that but once we got the sweet spot, you know, we've made derivatives, chemical derivatives. And uh, and they aren't toxic, at least according to the standard toxicity tests. Now, speak. I'll be honest. Uh, we spent a hundred thousand dollars sending out these uh, these these molecules for the standard tests that companies use, and it failed every one of them. Okay, it said it was toxic, but we did the test. We infected an animal. We inoculate. We administered this to an animal, and the animal was fine. What it says is the standard. Many of the standard tests used to assess toxicity. Are not correct. That's what that says. And so, but now you're fighting up. So, so you know, you're fighting upstream now again. Um, we've shown that the standard tests that's been used for, uh, say, for susceptibility. Well, that's not you know accurate as we thought it was. And we're saying that the standard tests that companies in the industry use, and the reason for it is, it's, it, I under, we understand it. I mean, the hardest part of doing antibody discovery, uh, where you spend the money, is when you're doing animal experiments and when you're doing human trials. That's where the that's where the bulk of the money is. Well, you you know you uh, you want to do all these in vitro tests that you can before you do that because that's the, the, that's cost a heck of a lot of money, and so we're saying well we, you can save a lot of money by going to the animal early, okay? Um, it's just a different viewpoint, and uh, and it's the one that we that we choose to to follow. Well, I I think we've gotten through the questions from the audience. I have a lot more questions, but we've run out of time. So uh, I guess I'd say this is certainly an informative and enlightening hour. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahan and Dr. De La Fuente for joining us and sharing your technology and research as well as their application. And I wanna thank the audience for your participation. And I'd like to invite everyone to our next JPS presentation on MXenes and the era of 2D material. And you can register at the sciencehistory.org website or reach us at the JPS at sciencehistory.org. And I hope to see you all then.
Hi, Christine.